Praise the Lord. Amen. It's wonderful to be here after so many years. And I see that things have changed for the better. Yeah. Normally, I don't want you to clap, but this time, you will clap. Praise the Lord. And um, I'm sending a special message to you through our group uh, pastor at the end of the meeting. But I just want to tell you, it's been a wonderful meeting since we began today. And uh, when I came in, I saw the place was already full and it wasn't six o'clock yet. I said, this is deeper life. And the Lord bless you. And, um, is that the chorus leader? Do you raise up your hand? I want to tell you that this is singing. And the choir committed to the faith, committed to the truth. I cannot resist passing comments. This is wonderful. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus. We well, thank you for this wonderful day and this wonderful Bible study. We're asking, O oh Lord, that you bless your people and enrich our lives today in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that you open our understanding to the scriptures so that we'll get the very best from your word today. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. You can sit down. We're looking at First John chapter 2. And in First John chapter 2, I'm starting from verse 18. It says, little children, it is the last time. And John, the beloved, is writing to the believers. It's written about little children, about young men, and about fathers. But now he groups everybody together. And since he was aged John, the apostle, he was now in his 90s. He was writing to all people now and he calls everyone little children. And he wants everyone to understand it is the last time. As ye have heard that the Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists. Whereby we know that it is the last time. Have you noticed in that verse, the beginning says it is the last time. And at the end of that same verse, it says, we know that it is the last time. As we look at this passage, that is verses 18 to 29, you're going to discover it's talking about the believers. He wants the believers to know that in these last days, there are perilous times. And it's a real challenge for the church of the living God. And he wants us to abide and to remain in the truth, committed to the faith and committed to the truth, even to the very end. The word of God makes it abundantly clear that we're living in the last days. This is the last generation before Christ returns. The period between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ is referred to as the last days. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. In Hebrews chapter 1, I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 1. And we're reading from verses 1 and 2. So you will see the understanding of the New Testament about the last days. It says in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners speak in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, as in these last days spoken unto us by his son. It's telling us that the days they were living, even at that time when Christ came for the first time, and then through the time of his second coming, these are the very last days. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 16. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 16 to have an understanding of what the last days are. In verse 16 it says, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It's referring to the prophecy of Joel that in latter days, in the last days, he'll pour his spirit upon all flesh. And now it says, 
and it shall come to pass in the last day, says the Lord, that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. It's telling us that even at that time, when the Spirit was poured out on that day of Pentecost, the last days have begun. So you understand then, as we think about the last days, these are the very last days. In fact, Jesus said some signs were going to be shown. And he said, those people that are living, that generation living in the last hours of the last days, they see those things, it says that that generation will not pass until the end comes. We're looking at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 32. Matthew chapter 24, verse 32. It says in verse 32, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When the branch, when the branch is shed tender and they put a false leaves, you know that summer is near. It's talking to those who are familiar with agriculture. And it says, when you see the crops and see that you know it's already getting ready for harvest, then you know that the end, the time of the harvest is near. Now it tells us some, summer is near, rather, in verse 33. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, all the signs he gave in Matthew chapter 24, the earthquakes, nation against nation, terrorism, and all the things that you are hearing about today, and the things you are reading about in the newspapers, is telling us that at such a time, we shall remember, the end is very near. Since you know that the end is near. It is near even at the door. Then it says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all things be fulfilled. It's telling us that with all the signs we see, our things that are happening, we should know that the end is at hand. And if you are not born again, it will be a pity if Christ comes and you're still in sin. If Christ comes and you're still a backslider. Because he's telling us that we see the signs and we know that he's coming. And because we know he's coming and he's going to come suddenly. And he's coming very soon. And the time is very near. It says if you have not been born again, there is a time to be born again. If you are not ready yet for the coming of the Lord, you are not sanctified, you are not pure, you are not made holy. This is the time. This is not the time to backslide. And this is not the time to say, I'll get saved later. This is the very time to get saved. In the light of the second coming of the Lord. In the light of the coming of the Antichrist, in the light of the coming of the suddenness at which everything will happen, it says we ought to be ready. Now, as we're talking about the last days, let us understand that this is extensively spoken about in the scriptures. Number one, the Spirit speaks expressly. There's no doubt about it. The Holy Ghost is speaking and it speaks expressly. Number two, the scriptures state explicitly. As you read the scriptures, you understand the scripture speaks explicitly. Number three, the society shows externally. You look at everything around you, the society, and you will know that the end is very near. And number four, the scoffers scorn expectedly. Expectedly, you will know that the scoffers will scorn and they will scoff and they will say, where is the sign of his coming? And that's what you find, or that's what you find today. It is almost everywhere. Unbelievers everywhere. The people that are scoffing and scorning and saying that they don't believe, the Lord is coming. But number five, his servants say extensively. Number one, the Spirit speaks expressly that the latter times are here the latter days are here and this may be the very last hours of the last day we're looking at uh, first timothy chapter four in first timothy chapter four we're reading from verse one first timothy chapter four verse one now the spirit speaketh expressly is saying there's no doubt about this you cannot misinterpret what the holy ghost is saying because it speaks expressly the holy spirit the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of 
devils and speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Already you know that that is happening now. You know that the generation in which we are living is like people do not have any conscience. Their consciences are seared and their condemnation sealed. And that tells you then, as you hear the Spirit speaking, and it's expressing to you expressly that the Spirit, that the last time has come, you know, these are the last time. Number two, the scriptures state express, expressly or explicitly. The scriptures state explicitly that these are the last days. We're looking at Second Timothy chapter 3. Verses 1 and 2. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. It says, This know also that in the last days, very lost time shall come. In the last days, very lost time shall come. How do we know the last days? How do we know that those latter times are here today? Look at verse 2. For men shall be lovers of themselves. That's what they are. And then it goes on to say covetous. That's what they are. And then it goes on to say they'll be boasters. They'll be proud. They'll be blasphemers. And then it says that they'll be disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. That's what the scripture is saying. And it says when you see that in every street, in every community, in every family, when you see that in every city and every state, every nation of the world it says you must know that the, the scripture is stating explicitly these are the last times not only that the society shows externally you look at everything around you and you look at society and society by their behavior by their action by their characteristics and things they demonstrate externally you don't have to be a researcher to find out this you find it everywhere and you know it everywhere and it says society is showing it externally Let, let's look at this uh, second timothy chapter 3 and i'm going to read back from verse 1 again it says in chapter 3 verse 1 this know also that in the last days great lost time shall come for men shall be lovers of themselves and that they'll be covetous they'll be boasters they'll be proud and blasphemers and they will be disobedient to parents and unthankful and unholy it says without natural affection you hear of mothers that will deliver a baby and just throw the baby into the gutter you hear of babies that will mothers that go to maternity and they deliver a baby and they run away and they leave the child there you hear about fathers and mothers burning up their children you hear of parents that are destroying their children by themselves and you here are people that do some unnatural things. It's telling you that society is demonstrating and showing, declaring externally these are the last times. And if you see the signs everywhere in the scriptures, you see the signs everywhere as the spirit is speaking, you see the signs everywhere as society is demonstrating and then you are still careless and you are lax and you are not uh, you are in frivolity and uh, levity. It means that you are not listening to the voice of the spirit Look at uh, verse 4. It says, There be traitors and heady and high minded and lovers of pleasures, mothers of sports, lovers of entertainment, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness. They see money to go to church. And it's a kind, it's a kind of a churchy, religious people, society in which we're living. And yet, with all that, they are not born again. With all that, they are not following after the Lord. It says, That tells you, as we look at society, ex Externally, that these are the very last times. And then it says in the latter part of that verse 5, from such turn away. But the scoffers have their part. They have their part and, you know, over the radio, over television, over the internet, in the papers, everywhere, the scoffers are scoffing. And they say, there's nothing like that. Christ is coming. They don't even accept the first coming of Christ. They do not even accept, accept the first sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's atonement. It's sacrifice. And what he did to get us saved, they say, we don't even believe in the first coming of Christ. And you're talking about the second coming of Christ. We're looking at uh, for the second Peter chapter 3. In 2 Peter chapter 3, I'm reading here from verse 3. Knowing this, first, that there shall come in the last days. You see that? 
all the preachers are telling us there are the last days and that these are the very last days and it says knowing this force that the there shall come in the last days coffers walking after their own laws and saying where is the promise of his coming for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And then they say, then then Peter, the apostle by the Spirit says, for this they willingly are ignorant of. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and, and the earth standing out of the waters and in the water whereby the world that was then being overflowed with water perished when uh, noah was telling the people of his own generation the last days are here for us everything is going to be destroyed a flood is coming and the flood will cover the whole of the earth everybody will perish Vegetation will not continue. All the professions will not continue. The last days are here. They scorched. They said there's nothing like that. But that day eventually came. And the scoffers have started the same trade. And they have started the same scoffing. And they have started the same jesting and jeering. That the end will not come. Look at verse 7. But the heavens and the earth that are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. It's, it's very clear then that the last days are here. Now the servants of the Lord say extensively, that means from the Old Testament to the New Testament, extensively the servants of the Lord said, there are the last days, and the last days will come. We're looking at De Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, and I'm reading here from verse 30. Deuteronomy chapter 4, reading here from verse 30. As far back as the time of Moses, he declared to the people, he declared to the Israelites that those last days will come. Chapter 4, verse 30. It says in verse 30, when thou art in tribulation, and all these seas are come upon thee, even in the latter days. You see that? That's Moses. Far back in the Old Testament. He says, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God, and shall be obedient to his voice, then he said, what the Lord will do. But it, it is clear to us that even Moses declared to the people, the end will come, and there will be the last days, and there will be the uh, generation of the children of Israel that will be living in the last days. And he said, at that time, they shall call upon the Lord, because they would have gone astray. Chapter 31, verse 29. Deuteronomy chapter 31, and we're reading from verse 29. Here in verse 29, it says, For I know that after my death, ye will utterly corrupt yourselves, and then turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you. Tell me the rest there. In the latter days, you see, you see what Moses is saying? He said, I'll be going. But the world is not ending now. But Moses said, there is a time coming. And it's in the latter days, in the last days, evil will befall you. Think about the children of Israel. Think about how they were scattered abroad all over the earth. And in this, uh, just recently, a few years ago, in uh, this past century, 1948, then they came back to their land. And you see all the wars that have been waging against them between Palestine and the children of Israel and all that. These are the last days that Moses spoke about. And in the latter times, if we don't uh, wake up now, there's no other time. This is our last chance. It is the last hour of the last day for the people that are living in in the world today. And let's look at Ezekiel. These are the servants of the Lord speaking extensively that there are the last days. Ezekiel chapter 38 and I'm reading from verse 16. Ezekiel chapter 38 and we'll read from verse 16. The last days. 38 verse 16. Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 16 and thou shalt come up against my people my people of Israel as a cloud 
to cover the land, it shall be in the latter days. It's talking about the coming of the Antichrist that will wage war against the children of Israel. And Ezekiel looking ahead, he said, I know the day is coming and it's called the latter days or the last time. And when that day comes, I know that you'll come against my people, against the children of Israel. We're looking at Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10 and I'm reading here from verse 14. Daniel Chapter 10, verse 14. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. The angel spoke to Daniel. He said, Daniel, you know what? The latter days are coming. And the last days are coming. And I've come to make you understand what will happen in the last days and the latter days. For yet the vision is for many Days. We're looking at Jude. Jude has only one chapter. In Jude, we're reading from verse 17 and verse 18. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you that there should be mockers in the last time. There should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly laws. And so, as we talk about the last days, John, the beloved, makes it very clear and pointedly that if you look at everything the Spirit is speaking expressly, the latter days are coming. The scripture states explicitly the latter days are here and society shows externally that the latter days are here and the scoffers con expectedly that the latter days are here and the servants of the lord say extensively that the latter days are here there are deceivers there are uh, people that are influenced by the spirit of the antichrist and the spirit of the antichrist invading and influencing and saturating the hearts the lives of unbelievers and so-called preachers today they invade the world and it is to prepare them for the wicked one that is for the antichrist that shall come we're coming back to first john chapter 2 first john chapter 2 as i've told you we're looking today at resisting deceivers and antichrists in the last days resisting deceivers and antichrists in the last days. Uh, that's in First John chapter 2. Reading from verse 18. There are three points we're going to consider today. Number one, the dangers of antichrists in these last days. The dangers of antichrists in these last days. Number two, the devotion that abides till the last day. The devotion, that's a commitment. That's the discipleship. That's the consecration that abides till the very last day. You're a Christian. You're a believer. You're born again. You're a child of God. And then you're dedicated to the Lord, devoted to the Lord. And you're promising the Lord you're going to continue till the very last day. There's a kind of devotion. There's a kind of dedication. There's a kind of commitment. There is a kind of consecration that abides till the last day. Number three, our destiny at his appearing these last days one of these last days it will appear and the heavens will open and then christ will come and then he'll call us home because the dead shall rise and those of us which are alive at the time of his appearing will be caught together with him that talks about our destiny at his appearing these last days we'll come back to uh, point number one the dangers of antichrist in these last days we're reading from chapter 2 first john chapter 2 and i'm reading here from verse 18 it says little children it is the last time and as she have heard that the antichrist shall come even now are there many antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time they went out from us but they were not of us for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest, made known that they 
were not all of us. It talks about the danger of Antichrist in the last days. Now you'll see here in that verse 18, it says, look at the first part there, little children. It is the last time. And as she have heard that the Antichrist shall come. That's one. The real Antichrist. A personality. The ruler of the world at the time of the great tribulation is a single personality that's not plural. The Antichrist shall come. It's still to come. It's in the future. It was in the future when John the Beloved was speaking. And it is still in the future even today as we're reading this verse. But look at the second part of that verse. Even now are there many Antichrists. That's plural. It's saying... The real Antichrist, the single personality, the ruler of the world, and the one that will be the prince over the world at the time of the great tribulation is still to come. That's in the future. He shall come. But then he says, but even now, at this time, in this generation, and in these last days, it says there are many Antichrists, which convinces us that this is the last time. And then he wants to explain who they are. And what they do. And now you can recognize them. And then it says, they went out from us. It's saying that these were not people that never heard about Christ. These are not people that never heard the gospel. These are not people that never opened the Bible. It said they were with us. They went out from us. And then it says, but they were not of us. Their heart was not there. They heard everything we said with their ears. They heard everything we said with their mind. They tried to understand everything we said with their intellect. And they tried to understand, but they didn't believe. They didn't accept. They didn't apply the words to themselves. That's why it says, but even when they were here physically, their mind was not there. Their spirit was not there. And their heart was not there. And their commitment was not there. And then it said they went out from us. And then they were not all of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. If they were saved, as we are saved, if they were sanctified as we are sanctified, if they were committed to Christ as we are committed to Christ, if they were abiding as we are abiding, if they loved the Lord like we love the Lord, if they loved the word of God like we love the word of God, they would no doubt have stayed. But they went out that the Lord might reveal to us that they were with us physically, they were not there spiritually, he said. That's why they went out and then he said that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Uh, let's look at those things uh, one by one. Number one is the Antichrist itself. The Antichrist. That is the personality that is still to come. It's referred to in the Bible as uh, the son of perdition, as the man of sin, as the king of fierce countenance, he, when he comes, he will deny the true Christ. He will oppose the true Christ. And he will blaspheme the name of the Lord. And he will do things to change the times and to change uh, all the plan of God and the policies of God. But eventually, he will be destroyed. Let's come to Daniel. We're looking at Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8, the Antichrist that shall come. That evil personality that shall come and will come at the very last moment of the last days. We're looking at Daniel chapter 8 and I'm reading from verse 9. In verse 9 it says, and out of one of them came forth a little horn, which was exceeding great towards the south and towards the east and towards the pleasant land. And it was great even to the host of heaven that he is uh, fighting against God and fighting against the purpose of God and the plan of God. He was great towards the uh, host of heaven and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. He'll be so mighty, he'll be so great. Then it says here, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away. That is, he will have a policy. 
and it will have a goal. It will have a kind of edict that the worship of God by the children of Israel will be stopped. And it will stop all the place sacrifice and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. That's talking about the Antichrist that shall come. And look at chapter 7 of Daniel verse 24 and verse 25. Talking about this one that is coming and the ten horns out of his kingdom are ten kings that shall arise and another shall rise after them and he shall he, he shall be diverse, different, distinct from the false and he shall subdue three kings and he shall speak, look at this, great words against the most high the antichrist that shall come he will speak great wars against the most high and he shall wear out the saints the children of israel the saints of the most high and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until look at this a time one year and times two years and the dividing of time Half a year, half of a year. That's three and a half years right there. When he will actually do evil and then he will torment the children of Israel in a very violent and terrible way. We're looking at Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 from verse 23. It tells us in verse 23, and in the latter time of their kingdom. You see that? The latter time, the last time we're talking about, and the last days we're talking about. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance. That's the Antichrist. is referred to by many titles and many names. A king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up and his power shall be mighty but not by his own power and he shall destroy woefully, wonderfully, terribly. He shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people and through his policy his political policy his economic policy is uh, whatever it is policy has also shall he cause craft deception hypocrisy uh, and lies to prosper at his hand and he shall magnify himself in his hand and by peace that is, uh, have a peaceful policy politically. By peace shall he destroy many. And he shall also stand up against the prince of princes. Uh, stand up against the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it's Antichrist. Christ is the prince of peace. Is the one that paid for salvation. Is the one that has come to redeem us. But this Antichrist will stand against the prince of princes. But he shall be broken without hand. Somebody says, Amen. amen. We're looking at Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11, you'll see that uh, the Bible speaks extensively of the Antichrist that shall come. That's why John the Beloved said, you have heard that the Antichrist shall come. And that is one we know why we know that this is the last time. And not only that that personality shall come, the spirit of that Antichrist is now working in many hearts, in many lives, and in many countries, in many nations. That's the reason we know that this is the last time. Chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 31. Chapter 11, and we're looking at verse 31. And it says, An arm shall stand on on his on his part and then it, it goes on to say and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and they shall take away the daily sacrifices and they shall place abomination that maketh desolate that's what jesus spoke about when he said when you see the desolation the abomination of desolation spoken about by daniel then you know that that time is near then let's come back to this to john first john in first john we're looking at uh, chapter 2 first john chapter 2 and i'm reading from verse 18 first john chapter 2 verse 18 says little children it is the last time and as you have heard that the antichrist shall come 
the Antichrist shall come. He's talking about that personality that shall come. As we've read in Daniel, that's Old Testament. Let's look at the New Testament and see that, uh, you know, this Antichrist is coming in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and here we're reading from verse 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, why don't you back up to verse 9? Even him, you see that? That's not plural, that's singular. Even him, that's a personality. Even him, that's an individual person. He'll be a politician. He'll be a ruler. He'll be a king of fierce countenance. He'll be a person that has that can make policies and pass edicts. He'll be a person that can destroy, that will have all kinds of power, political power, military power. Look at verse 9 again. Even him who's coming is still to come. And that's what Paul the Apostle is saying here. Who's coming is after the walking of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Then it goes on to say, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved for and for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they shall believe a lie. Sometimes you meet people that are deluded and they believe a lie. And you try to talk to them. You open the scriptures to them. And they can see what you're saying. They understand the words we're reading. But they'll say, I hear what you say, but I stand where I stand. You say, but this is error. This is false doctrine. You say, but this will lead to destruction and perdition. It says, that's what you think. This is what I believe. It says, God has permitted a strong delusion that you believe a lie. And then it says in verse, in verse 12, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Uh, that's the Antichrist that shall come. Now, let's come back to 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. You see there's an Antichrist in the singular, the one that shall come. But there's Antichrist in the plural. The Antichrist that are already there today. Already they are there today. In 1 John chapter 2, that verse 18 again, little children. It is the last time. And as ye have heard that the Antichrist shall come. Even now, it's left the one to come. It's not talking about the present time and the present age and the present dispensation. And it says, even now, are there few antichrists? Some antichrists? Many, many enough to appear in every city. Many enough to appear in every nation. There's no nation you go to that you'll not find the spirit of the Antichrist already, already walking. You know, when Christ was to come, there was a forerunner. And the forerunner, what's the name of the forerunner of Jesus Christ? John the Baptist, the Antichrist will try to copy the Lord Jesus Christ. Before he comes, he sends forth anti Antichrists in the plural. The people that will operate in the spirit of the Antichrist. That's why it says there that even now, are there are many Antichrists whereby we know. Whereby we know that it is the last time. Now he's going to describe who they are. Look at verse 19. They went out from us. What that means is that number one, they backslid. But you know, backsliding is not the last stage. They became from backsliders, they went to being reprobates. And then that's not the last stage. They went from backsliding to being reprobate, and then they have now become apostates. Apostates. Again, you understand, there are apostles. Those are the people that are serving the Lord. Those are the people that are preaching the true gospel. But there are apostates, the people that are falling away completely. And then it says, these are the people, they have the spirit of the Antichrist. They went out from us, but they were not of us. They were not of us. Sometimes when you meet people and they believe the same thing we believed before. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is healer. Jesus is a message. Jesus is a sanctifier. Jesus is a deliverer. Jesus is the power of Pentecost and Jesus is coming again. We sang it, we preached it, we believed it and we prayed and we consecrated. And now you see them outside and then you say brother, you say, don't come here brother, I'm not your brother. What do you mean? Are you not uh, with us again? Ah, I've let you people 
And so we are now we people, and eventually you ask myself, no, I don't accept all those things anymore about Jesus. Don't tell me that this is what I believe now. There's power in this, there's power in this, there's power in that. And then you are surprised. You say, don't be surprised. Before they left, they became backsliders. Then when they left as backsliders, they became reprobates. And then when they became reprobates and there was nobody to get them back and they didn't want to come back, they became apostates. That's why the apostle is saying they've gone far. They went out from us. But they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have remained with us. But they went out and uh, that, they were, uh, that they might be shown or revealed that they were not of us. Look at um, this. Uh, uh, look at uh, First John chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 3. First John chapter 4. We're looking at verse 3. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus is the Christ, it, 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 that Jesus has come in the flesh, is not of God. This is, tell me what you find there. The spirit of the Antichrist. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. It influences them. It inspires them. It confuses them. It kinds of a, a kind of dulls them. Their mind. They cannot understand, and they cannot benefit from the word of God. It, it says, "This is that spirit of the Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it shall come, and even now already is it in the world." The Antichrist is coming, but you have the spirit of the Antichrist already in the world, confusing people and making people to say things that are not right and do things that are not right. And look at 2 John, 2 John has just one chapter. I'm reading from verse 7. 2 John, verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and tell me, an antichrist is telling us that a deceiver is an antichrist. Why did he say that? Because, you know, a deceiver is taking the truth of Jesus Christ and is twisting it. It's distorting it. It's reversing it. It's saying that what Jesus said is not true. He is opposed to Christ. He is antichrist opposed to Christ and he replaces his own error with the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it says many deceivers have gone into the world. They deceive, they'll deceive you on the way to salvation. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. And somebody who had believed that before will come back to say, now tell me. You mean to say that if somebody does not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he will not get to heaven? And these people, they're good-natured people. They try to do the best they can. I'm telling you that even some of them are better than you people who say you are born again. Don't tell me that Jesus is the only way. Then you open your mouth. You cannot close your mouth. You say, but you believe before that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. You say, no, I don't accept that. But it is Jesus Christ who said that. And the fellow will say, well, if Jesus said that, Jesus was wrong. How can it be the only way? There must be other ways. You don't mean to tell me that except somebody believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, he cannot get to heaven. He says, no, I don't accept that. They are opposed to Christ and they are antichrist. And then you show them in the word of God, you say, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. He says, there you are again. You, are you don't understand grace. The grace of God covers everything. Explain what you mean by the grace of God covers everything. Well, even if you are not holy, even if you are fighting and you might hear even be fighting and angry and you might even kill somebody and distress somebody until the point you die. But once you just know that God, I depend on your mercy, I'm not qualified to get to heaven, only your grace will get me to heaven, that covers everything. Forget about holiness. And then you say, let me open the Bible to you. It says I know where you are going to open. I'm telling you I don't accept. You see, what's that? That's the Antichrist and the spirit of the Antichrist already walking in them and they do not know and you should not be surprised that's why john the beloved said i'm telling you that there are many deceivers in the world and many of these people opposed to christ and antichrist the spirit is working in them that's why it says in verse 8 look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought which we have done but that we receive a full reward it says whosoever 
transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, has not God. I don't want to mention names, but I could tell you. People that are known internationally and people that have traveled all over the world and they are prayed that Jesus is the only Savior. And they are prayed that except a man be born again, he cannot be saved. He cannot get to the kingdom of God. And today they are still alive. And uh, they, they ask them question on the television and ask them question in the media. Somebody interviewed them and said, uh, do you still believe that Jesus is the only Savior? Oh, he said, uh, well, you know, I've traveled to a lot of places and all these places I've traveled to, I found people that have never heard of Jesus. They don't know Jesus and we have not got to them. And these people are sincere and they are honest. And he believes now that in their honesty and in their heathenism and paganism, they will get to heaven because, you know, they are trying to follow the little light they have, although they don't know Jesus as savior and then they challenge uh, this fellow and then but uh, you know originally when you were younger what you preach that uh, jesus is the only way you must be born again except you are born again you cannot see the kingdom of god he said well i'm telling you now that i've traveled wide and with everything i've seen i cannot be that categorical anymore you see that that's the spirit of the antichrist walking already in the minds of people i pray that if that spirit knocks at your door it will not find you at home and will not swallow you up in the spirit of the age in Jesus' name. That's why it says, Whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, as not God, he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. It says, If there come any unto you, and break not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that bideth him God's speed is part partaker of his evil deeds. Well, already you see from the word of God that those uh, antichrists and deceivers, they will come and that they are already in the world. They are antichrists because uh, they distort the truth of Christ. They are antichrists because they misinterpret the scriptures and the doctrine of Christ. They are antichrists because they are opposed to Christ and they are hostile to the salvation that comes through Jesus and Jesus alone. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. They are indwelt by the principle of evil and they are motivated by the spirit of the Antichrist and they preach and spread the errors and the damning lies of Satan. Many deceit people see them as Christ's servants. They say, well, what I know is that so-and-so is still a servant of God and so-and-so is still a preacher of the gospel, but it's another gospel. It's a perverted gospel. It's an erroneous gospel, a gospel that leads people astray. In reality, they are antichrist walking against Christ. Uh, can I tell you what uh, John t tells us by the Spirit they will do? Number one, they deny the Christ. They deny the Christ. Number two, they desert the church. They depart from the church. Number three, they deceive the Christian. Number one, they deny the Christ. Look at uh, for Second Peter chapter two. Second Peter chapter two. I'm reading here from verse uh, from verse one. It says, "But there were false prophets among, also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately, privily shall bring in what kind of heresies." damnable heresies. The heresies that will damn their own soul and the heresies that will damn the souls of the people they are talking to. They bring in damnable heresies even denying the Lord that, tell me, bought them. They were saved before. They bought them. They were redeemed before. They were children of God before. But for one reason or the other, they have departed from Christ and now they bring in damnable heresies, denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Number one, they deny the Christ. Number two, they desert the church. They depart from the church. They desert the church. Look at First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 19. First John chapter 2 verse 19. It says they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out. 
that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. They desert the church. Number three, they deceive the Christian. First John chapter 2, verse 26. First John chapter 2, verse 26. These things have I reaching unto you concerning them that seduce you. Concerning them that will try to deceive you. If you stay long with them, you will you'll change your conviction. If you stay long with them, you'll say, I, the man is talking intelligently. Yes, Satan has intelligence. The man is talking convincingly. Satan convinced, um, you know, Eve that she should eat of the fruit of the tree that God has said not to eat. The man is talking in a sensible manner. And as when Judah spoke to the people that gave him 30 pieces of silver, he spoke in a sensible manner. It is not that you are looking at the very fact that you know the doctrine of Christ. And you know what Christ has said? Anybody trying to bring uh, arguments and philosophy and policy or whatever to, de to derail you or to convince you that the way of the Lord is not true, you say, no, please, I don't want to listen to that. This is what I know. Christ is the Savior. And thank God Christ is my Savior. Somebody there I say, Christ is my Savior. You will never leave him in Jesus' name. That is the uh, next point. That means you want to abide, you want to remain and stay with the Lord. It tells us in the first John chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 20. First John chapter 2 from verse 20. The devotion that abides to the last day. I'm looking at abiding people. You'll abide in Jesus' name. And you remain till the very end in Jesus' name. First John chapter 2, verse 20. But she have ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. It's talking to these little children, it's talking to the believers. It says, You have an unction. Unction is the same as anointing, and anointing is the same as being filled with the Holy Spirit, and is the spirit of truth. It says in verse 21, I have not reached unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know each and that there is no lie in the truth. It, it says, I'm right to you, because you know the truth, you love the truth, you abide in truth, you accept the truth, and the spirit of truth is working in, in you. Look at verse 24. It says, let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. And it says, this is the promise that he has promised us, even eternal life. Verse 27, but the anointing which ye have, which ye have received of him abides in you. Amen. And ye have no need that any man teach you, but of the same, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things is a truth, and, and is truth. Then he says, and it's no lie, even as it has taught you, ye shall abide in him. I will abide in him. Uh, what was John the beloved saying here? He's saying, we are reaching to you. We are apostles of the Lord. We are reaching unto you. You know that we are filled with the Spirit of God. You know that we are inspired by the Spirit of God. You know that we are taught by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God that taught us and used us to pass the message to you, he bore witness in your heart that this is the truth. You don't need any of these other teachers. And you, you know, there are some people that are so eager. They come to the Monday Bible study. They listen to us on Thursday. They listen on Sunday. And there's still something in there. I want to buy that book. I want to buy that tape. I want to buy it. It says you don't need all that. Already you know the truth. All that you have had, all you need. Have you heard about the word of salvation? Let that abide in you. Have you heard about the word? If you continue in me, then shall ye might be my disciple indeed. Let that abide in you. Have you heard of being sanctified? That he prayed for the disciples, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is, he said, that's enough for you. Let that abide in you. And then have you heard, you shall receive power after that 
the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you had that from us, and you prayed, and you got the Holy Ghost, let that be enough for you, and abide in that. Have you had go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and there is something in you that is reminding you, when you see a sinner somewhere, talk to him, tell him about Christ, and that unction is in you, that anointing is in you, and anytime you hear the truth, your mind is saying, praise the Lord, that is the truth. Anytime somebody says something, maybe you are passing on the road, and you overhear from the radio, or maybe the loudspeaker, and you say, no, that is not true, that is not true. It says already, you have the spirit in you. Do not listen to those people outside that will deceive you because you need to abide. I pray you'll abide in Jesus' name. You know, the spirit that lives in us, what kind of spirit is that? Let me show you in John chapter 14. John chapter 14, when it says you have an unction and you have the spirit, look at the kind of spirit abiding in you, abiding in me, abiding in us. In John chapter 14, we're looking at verse 26 for the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things. He shall teach you all things. You don't need a side of the road a preacher, a side of the road deceiver, a side of the road being a, a person being influenced by the uh, spirit of the Antichrist. You don't need all the watchtower, what they call watchtower magazine. They knock at your door or want to show you a magazine or show you what. You don't need all that. He says, you know the truth already. The curiosity can lead you astray. Being inquisitive, I want to hear what they are saying. I want to know what they are saying. I just want to I want to engage them in argument. It can lead you astray. Look at what it says here. It says already that he has taught you all things and then bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. It says you have Jesus, you have enough. You have the Bible, you have enough. You have the Holy Ghost, you have enough. And I pray that that eagerness to hear from the opposite side, I pray that God will take that eagerness away from you in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 16, verse 13. It says, I'll be it when he, the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth has come. He will guide you into all truth. Are you trying to say that the spirit of truth is too slow and therefore you want to go before the spirit of truth leads you into all truth? You want to go to those uh, wayside people, deceivers and uh, ruinous people, false teachers. The Holy Ghost is not sufficient for you. You don't trust what Jesus Christ has said, that the Holy Ghost will lead you into all truth. Therefore, you are going to them. Say, don't you do that. He says, the spirit of truth, that's his title. When he's come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. All those uh, prophets who are deceiving people, they are not the people to show you anything. They have nothing to show you. But the Holy Ghost will show you all things. He will in Jesus' name. And then uh, because he tells us in uh, John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 31. John chapter 8. We're reading from verse 31. In verse 31, here is what the Lord is telling us himself. It says, uh, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed in him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. I think about what you know already. If I told you to give me your favorite verse in Genesis, you're likely to find a verse in Genesis. I tell you, give me a favorite verse in Exodus, you're likely to give me. I go to Joshua, give me a favorite verse in Joshua, you're likely to tell me. I say, do you have any favorite chapter in 1 Samuel? You're likely to tell me. Anything from Ruth, you're likely, you are not even thinking, you just roll it out, you're likely to tell me. Can you tell me something in Job? You're likely to tell me. Can you refer to something? Tell me something you know in the, in the Psalms. You're likely to tell me about the Proverbs, you'll just open and tell me something in the Proverbs, and I'm saying, do you have any idea of what Isaiah has written at all? Can you tell me something in Isaiah chapter 1, chapter 53? You'll just tell me, have you read Jeremiah? What I'm saying is, we know enough. All we need to do now is this one that I know, let me soak it in. 
let me let me have it and think over it and meditate upon it we know enough that will take us to heaven we will get to heaven and then we'll come to Matthew and I show and I tell you, can you tell me something in Matthew or Mark? Tell me something that you know in Luke. Well, I, and you didn't ask you before. I just came to you. I just bumped at you. Can you tell me something in John? Can you tell me something in Acts? And the scene will just become, the scene is there. You have the truth already. Don't go to all those people. They are deceivers. In fact, you can teach them. You will teach them. And that's why the Lord is telling us, he says, just abide in what you know already. And because he says, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. We're looking at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 16. Colossians chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 16. Let the word of Christ, wonderful, let the words of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your heart with unto the lord and he said and whatsoever ye do in word or deed do all in the name of the lord jesus giving thanks to god and the father by him. I pray that this word we have known already will abide with us till the very end in Jesus name. Amen. Salvation results in devotion to Christ and departure from deceivers and antichrists. The grace of God keeps those who are genuinely saved in the truth. It will keep you in the truth in Jesus name. Those who depart from the truth manifest the fact that they do not remain. They do not abide in Christ. They do not abide in grace they do not abide in salvation denying christ in doctrine denying christ in character denying christ in behavior denying christ in the heart denying christ before the world will result in being lost forever because backsliders if they are not careful and if they are not decisively restored unto the lord eventually will be overwhelmed by the spirit of the antichrist and they will fall away i will not be among them but you know if you're a real child of god you have the spirit of god abiding inside you that spirit of god is a built-in lie detector lie detector lie detector is you know somebody is saying something that is not correct and he thinks he has he thinks he has sold the uh, lie to you there's a detector inside you that will say uh-uh that's a lie that's a lie i don't accept you may not even remember the verse that goes along with what you are saying but you just know that lie detector is uh, inbuilt inside you and it will shield you and protect you from error you will not fall Let's come now to point number three. Point number three, where we're looking at this, which is our destiny at his appearing. Our destiny at his appearing these last days. I'm reading from chapter 2, verse 28. First John chapter 2. In first John chapter 2, we're reading from verse 28. It says in verse 28, And now, little children, abide in him. It's saying the secret of uh, remaining in fellowship with the Lord and remaining victorious and remaining real children of God is abide in him. The secret of not being ashamed when Christ shall come and people are pointing at you, we thought you were a believer. Why didn't you go? We thought you were a real child of God. Why did you miss the rapture? The secret of overcoming and the secret of uh, not coming to that kind of shame is abide in him. That's why it says, and now little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. You will not be ashamed. You will stay in salvation, abide in salvation. What a wonderful thing if the trumpet shall sound. And then the saints are caught, are, you know, caught away. And then we appear at the very presence of Christ. And I see you and you see me. I will say, I have a brother so and so. Look at him there. I have a sister so and so. Look at her there. And we're all there at the feet of Jesus. What a glorious day it will be on that day. 
And the secret of that happening, and for that to happen in your life, in my life, in our lives together, is that we abide in him. In verse 29, it says, if ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. You see, there are a lot of things that it says, number one, and now little children. It's telling us that because of the time in which we live, because of the dispensation in which we live, we need to uh, tighten our belt and we need to get ready because the Lord is coming. Look at Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, I'm reading here from verse 11. Romans 13, we're reading from verse 11. It says in verse 11, and that knowing the time that now it is high time, to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation, our redemption are being caught away nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. And that day is at hand. It's talking about the day of Christ, the day of his appearing. That day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as it is as in the day, and not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering or wantonness, nor in strife and uh, in envy. But put ye on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the laws thereof. It says, Because the Lord is coming, and when he comes, it's going to come unannounced. It's going to come when many people are sleeping, but you will not be asleep. It's going to come suddenly. Look at this, uh, that word suddenly. It's in the first Thessalonians chapter 5. When it comes, it's going to appear. It's the day of his appearing, the time of his appearing. It will be sudden. In uh, first Thessalonians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for ye yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night for when they shall say peace and safety then tell me sudden destruction cometh upon them not upon us I said not upon us upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape verse 9 but God has not appointed us to us but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ let me read that to you now again for God has not appointed you to us but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the Lord wants us to be awake. He wants us to be ready because he's coming. And then he talks about he shall appear. He shall appear. Look at that language. He shall appear. Colossians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. You will not be ashamed. You'll be confident when he comes. You'll remain safe when he comes. Thank God I will see you over there. It tells us in uh, Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. The Lord is coming and he wants us to be ready. And thank God we're going to be ready. In Titus chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 13. Looking for, looking for that, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Where are those people? Thank God they are there. Look at First John chapter three verse one. First John chapter three verse one. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, upon you, that we shall be called the sons of God. 
Therefore, the world knoweth him not because, knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Now am I a child of God. Now born again, now are you a child of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Christ is coming again. And John, the beloved, emphasized the very fact that we are expecting his coming. And we want to abide until he comes. Abide in Christ. Abide in the faith. Abide in faithfulness until the very end. Christ will soon appear. Only those who are made righteous by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb, only those who are kept righteous by faith in him will be received up to glory. And thank God I will be there. He tells us then to hold on to the very end. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Holding on to the end, abiding to the very end. Revelation chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 25. It says, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. Don't allow these deceivers to take your confidence away. Don't allow anybody to bring doubt in your mind. Don't allow anybody to shift your focus and shift your attention away from Christ. He is our Savior. There's no other Savior. He is our sanctifier. There's no other sanctifier. He is our prince, our king. There's no other king. And he is the one that is coming back. He's coming back for us. And we're going to see him on that final day. You have believed so far, so good. But so farther, so better. Amen. Things will be better in your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Every day you wake up, you say, Lord, I'm expecting your coming. And Lord, keep me ready. Keep me ready. Keep me ready. He will keep you ready in Jesus' name. Amen. The last chapter of Revelation. The last chapter of Revelation. We're reading from chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. And I'm reading from verse 12. Behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. You will not stop working for God. Your reward will be waiting for you. And on that final day, I said, the Lord is going to crown the faithful. We will see your crown. And there will be stars in your crown in Jesus' name. It says, my reward is worth me to give to every man, every man, you will not miss your own. According as his, as his work shall be, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Verse 14, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gate into the city. Enter in through the gate into the city. What are the people that will enter in? The Lord confirm it to your life in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. There are antichrists in the world. There are deceivers in the world. But you are praying that the Lord will not allow you to be swallowed up, to be overwhelmed by the spirit of the antichrist and by the spirit of the age, by the deception of the age. The Lord is going to be with you. And the Lord will support you and sustain you. You will not fall. You will not fail. You will not be deceived. You will not backslide. You will abide in the Lord until the final day. The Lord is coming. Make sure that you are ready. You must be saved. You must be sanctified. And you must be serving the Lord wholeheartedly. Without looking back, the grace of God will keep you to the end. Open your mouth and pray.